Welcome to Navara Live on a Tuesday afternoon. I'm Michael Walker, and a little bit later, I'll be joined by Mike Bancole. Um, we've got lots of different stories for you tonight. Drink spiking um, is to be made a criminal offence. It already isn't quite legal, but it's going to be made a specific criminal offence. And we'll also discuss the assisted dying bill and Tom Watson's um, cushy new job at Palantir. Um, for the people who were suspicious about Palantir linking up um, with the NHS, um, these lobbying deals from former MPs probably isn't going to help. Israel's security cabinet is meeting to discuss a proposed ceasefire deal with Lebanon's Hezbollah. Um, but while a pause in hostilities might be on the table, Israel has ramped up its bombardment of Lebanon. Um, several missile strikes have rocked southern Beirut today, with reports emerging of further strikes in the center of the city. At least 10 people have been killed. But these are only the latest attacks in an assault that's been intensifying over recent days. Those were just a few of the Israeli strikes on apartment buildings and infrastructure across Beirut since Friday. On Saturday, at least four bombs hit an eight-storey apartment building in the Basta area of central Beirut. The attack came at four in the morning with no prior warning, collapsing the building as well as several other homes in the area. At least 29 people were killed and a further 67 were injured. Meanwhile, large areas in the south of Lebanon have been destroyed by the Israeli military. Israel's focus appears to have been on villages nearest to the country's border with Israel with satellite imagery released last month showing the scale of devastation in villages in the area north of the border. Israel's invasion of Lebanon began on October the 1st. That followed almost a year of cross-border fire from both Israel and Hezbollah, with Hezbollah saying it was fighting in support of Gaza. In that time, Israel also conducted frequent assassinations and attacks on Hezbollah leaders and members across Lebanon. So far, 3,670 people have been killed in Lebanon. Over 16,000 people have been injured and 1.2 million people have been displaced. In Israel, um, 46 civilians have been killed in the country's war with Hezbollah, with around 100,000 residents of northern Israel displaced. The ceasefire now under consideration might not end the carnage in Lebanon, but it would create a pause for 60 days. And that's at least initially. It's reportedly based on the UN's resolution 1701, requiring the withdrawal of both sides from the area south of the Latani River. Now, as you can see, Israeli troops have recently reached that river um, where they've been conducting raids. Other terms of the ceasefire include the deployment by Lebanon of its national troops to secure the border area um, and an international coalition of five members chaired by the US would be responsible for ensuring compliance. So what is UN Resolution 1701? Well, it was adopted unanimously in 2006 um, and the resolution aimed at brokering peace between Lebanon and Israel and marked the end of the 2006 Israeli invasion of Lebanon. Um, it called for the withdrawal of both Hezbollah and Israel from the area between the Latani River and Israel. Um, and the resolution also called for the full disarmament of all armed groups in Lebanon, including Hezbollah. Um, Israel would go on to claim that Lebanon failed to comply with the resolution as Hezbollah didn't disarm. Um, but in 2015, Israel was also found to have been flying fighter jets um, over the region itself, a breach of the resolution. Um, back to the present, both Hezbollah and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu um, have signaled their approval of the new ceasefire deal. Um, not everyone in Israel's government is keen, though. This was Israel's security minister, Itamar Ben-Gavir. So he said, as I warned before Gaza, I warn now as well. Mr. Prime Minister, it is not too late to stop this agreement. We must continue until the absolute victory. Um, former Israeli security cabinet member Benny Gantz um, gave his assessment. A good agreement will bring the residents of the North home. A ceasefire will bring back Hezbollah. He's supposed to be the moderate. If Israel agrees to the ceasefire, it will be the first the country has agreed to since November 2023 when there was a six-day truce in Gaza. Um, Lebanese media is suggesting any ceasefire would be announced at 10 p.m. local time. So that's 8 p.m. GMT. Earlier today, I caught up with Trita Parsi, Executive Vice President, the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. I began by asking him how likely a ceasefire is to be agreed, and if so, whether it will hold. It does appear very likely at this point. All the signals are coming 
that there will be some form of a ceasefire. The details, of course, are not entirely clear, and the devil is in the detail. But whether it would hold or not, of course, is a different matter. Um, and I think one of the critical elements of this is that uh, if it's about to be a 60-day ceasefire, it will expire right before or right after Trump comes into power, depending on exactly when the kickoff date is. And that's going to change the dynamics quite extensively in terms of does any one of these uh, parties want to be seen as the one that is violating the ceasefire or making it more difficult to renew it later on? We understand the, the terms of the ceasefire will be that Hezbollah withdraw to north of the Latani River, um, and to some degree, the Lebanese official army will, will be enforcing that. I mean, th- does Lebanon's official army have the capacity to police an area that size to stop Hezbollah returning? Or is the idea here that actually Hezbollah are also agreeing themselves um, to withdraw of their own account, of their own volition? There wouldn't be an agreement unless Hezbollah agreed to it itself. But it remains to be seen whether that actually ends up being uh, an element of this. Obviously, this is something that the Um, The U.S. and the Israeli side wants. It's part of 1701, but there's other elements of 1701 that uh, may also not have been implemented. And as a result, uh, it's it's not entirely clear. I think it's going to be crucial to see, of course, whether the final deal includes the ability for the Israelis to continue to strike Hezbollah, meaning that it actually isn't a ceasefire. It's just a unilateral one, a one-sided one. It will be crucial to also see whether UNIFIL will continue to play a role or whether the United States is going to be filling that void um, uh, and and taking on a position uh, that perhaps encroaches on what UNIFIL was doing before. Uh, The fact that the U.S. actually will have somewhat of a larger role in this than before is, is a major concession from the Lebanese side, mindful of the fact that the U.S. has been arming and aiding and and, and enabling Israel's genocide uh, in Gaza, as well as its bombardment of Lebanon. So uh, those are the details that will be very interesting to see whether that is the case or not. There is an interpretation that this, to a very large extent, may actually be a signal from the Iranians to the Trump administration, giving them some sort of a um, movement towards de-escalation before they come in as a positive gesture. It remains to be seen if that is A, true, and B, if that is how the Trump administration reads it. UNIFIL being the the UN peacekeepers, if I'm correct, that, that Israel says are not doing their job properly in terms of enforcing um, that resolution, um, 1701. Um, let's talk about the political significance of this, because, I mean, in many ways, this looks like a massive victory for Israel, right? They're getting pretty much what they wanted, which is Hezbollah off their border, north of the Latani River. And crucially, um, they've managed to separate the fronts. Um, So what seemed to be sort of the red line for Hezbollah beforehand, correct me if I'm wrong, is they were saying, we will only sign a ceasefire deal with Israel when you guys stop bombing, um, stop committing a genocide in Gaza. And now it seems as if the Israelis have have managed to pick off Hezbollah and sign a, a deal with them with the Lebanese government, which is completely independent of what they're doing in in Gaza, which would seem like a win for them and a a loss for the people of Gaza, I suppose. I mean, how would you respond to that? Again, it depends on exactly what the details of the deal are. On the first point, you know, Hezbollah accepted 1701, even though, of course, its full implementation never happened. So that in and of itself is not necessarily uh, that big of a change. But uh, you're quite correct that if this is a clear disconnect Uh, of the two different fronts, then that is definitely a concession that Lebanon, as well as the Iranians and others, are giving, and that the Israelis may declare a victory on. But, you know, at the end of the day, one has to wonder, you know, what the end strategic objective of the Israelis are, the achievement that they will come, that they will gain from uh, just continuing the slaughter uh, in in Gaza. Uh, At the end of the day, I think we have to remind ourselves that Israel is now headed by the person who is wanted by the ICC. Um, and, and as a result, if it continues the warfare in Gaza, which it seems like it likely will do, nevertheless, it will just add more and more details to that case against him. Whether he ever will be arrested or not, of course, is a big question mark. But the fact that the arrest orders have been issued, the fact that so many Western countries have failed to adhere to and live up to 
their promises, not just about international law, but all of this preaching about a rules-based order that we've heard so much about, that in and of itself is a huge, huge setback for the Israelis. And in terms of why this has been able to, to happen now, so why the Israelis have been able to sort of divide these, these fronts, you've mentioned there um, the Iranians potentially signaling um, something to Trump. I'd like to hear, hear more about that. Um, also, I suppose, is one hypothesis that just Israel have been very effective at um, sort of taking out Hezbollah's infrastructure. So they've sort of killed, managed to assassinate so many Hezbollah leaders that potentially Hezbollah just isn't the fighting force that it once was. And therefore, I mean, they're having to do something akin to surrendering. I mean, what would you make of, of those two interpretations? I think there's a bit of a narrative that is being pushed out there that says all of these different things that you mentioned. And it may very well be true, but there's a lot of data points that also puts a lot of that into question. First of all, we saw just yesterday that Hezbollah managed to shoot 320 or so rockets at Israel, uh, rockets that penetrated Tel Aviv, etc. So you're seeing Hezbollah fighting back in a way that, you know, Hamas or the Palestinians never were. Uh, and if Hezbollah really has completely lost its ability to fight back, we wouldn't have seen some of these things. Now, has Hezbollah been weakened because of the many people that have been killed, including many of its leaders? Without a doubt, they have. But it has it turned into uh, the type of a pushover that actually would have made it attractive for the Israelis to continue the war and, and move further north into Lebanon? Clearly not. And I think there is an argument made that precisely because Hezbollah is still managing to fight back, create chaos inside of Israel, hit Tel Aviv, it actually incentivized the Israelis to strike a deal. Uh, because the cost of warfare with Hezbollah turned out to be very, very different from the cost of the slaughter and, and genocide in Gaza. That's not to say that Hezbollah has not lost a lot. That's not to say that they're not weaker. But the idea that this was some sort of a stunning victory for the Israelis, uh, I'm not entirely convinced is the case, mindful of the fact that we're still seeing that Hezbollah is fighting back, that the number of Israelis being killed is staggering uh, and creating problems inside of Israel. And that, as a result, this has also been very costly for Israel. Let's talk just a little bit more, if I can ask you to elaborate on sort of the Iran hypothesis you put forward, which this might be um, Iran sending a message to Donald Trump to sort of try and say, let's, you know, start off not fighting on the front line between Hezbollah and, uh, and Israel. I mean, what would be the logic there? How do you see Trump-Iran relations developing, I suppose, the second time around? I think, first of all, the Iranians have been pushing for a de-escalation and a ceasefire al almost already immediately after October 7th. And they've been warning extensively about escalating the conflict. They did not want to see an escalation in Lebanon or the direct fires, exchange of fires that has taken place between Iran and Israel either. So in that sense, this is the very same thing that they've been pushing for for quite some time. Now, Trump coming in changes the equation, of course because there is a risk that Trump would escalate matters much further, but there's also an opportunity that Trump would want to see this end once and for all, instead of allowing it to just linger on the way that Biden did. And for that, the Iranians are asking themselves, what can they do? First, to establish direct contact with the Trump uh, team, uh, but also signal their willingness to be uh, flexible and play ball in a manner that they didn't do in 2017 when Trump first got elected. Because the cost on the one, high, on the one end is much higher than before if, it, uh, uh, you know, if Trump decides to escalate dramatically, but also the benefits are far greater because there is a belief in Tehran that Trump actually wants to end this fighting and that Trump has the backbone to say no to Netanyahu and that Netanyahu doesn't have the strength of violating Trump's red lines. Whereas none of that was true with Biden, as a result, there wasn't much of a confidence whatsoever that there could be a ceasefire under Biden. Just to end on sort of Trump and how he might differ from, from Biden. So sort of one hypothesis I hear when it comes to the Middle East you know, is that, that Trump might be able to sort of put an end to this um, and might sort of end the facade of sort of Biden saying, I want a two-state solution, but not acting on it, essentially letting Netanyahu do whatever he wants while saying he's really upset about it happening. Right? There, there is something um, which I think is very disingenuous about Biden's Middle East policy. Is there a danger, though, that Trump just comes in and says, look, uh, the problem here is that we haven't recognized that the Israelis are the winners, um, and we have to essentially let them you know, kick out half of the Palestinians from Gaza or resettle half of Gaza and sort of do... Um, or make explicit 
outcomes that the Biden administration weren't willing to to countenance, sort of officially, even if sort of by the back door, they were sort of allowing that to become potentially a de facto reality. So could could Trump come in here and basically suggest and impose something very, very, very difficult for the Palestinians to accept? I think there's a significant risk of that, and it would be a tremendously negative development for the region, just as Trump's own Abram Accords in many ways set the stage for this conflict by pushing the Palestinians aside. And if you were to do what you're suggesting, it would be do, do the same thing, but times 10, essentially, and it would be extremely destabilizing. We do have to be honest, though, and I think your answer did correctly point out that it's not as if the Biden administration wasn't doing this. They were just not embracing it. They were not moving fast on it. And in many ways, if Trump goes in this direction, as he has done with other things, he is mostly an accelerator of American foreign policy that already existed rather than being a dramatic change. The Abram Accords itself essentially was skipping five or six steps uh, and going to the end chase, essentially, uh, cutting to the chase, which is forget about the Palestinians. Let's just, you know, do something to raise their quality of living, but they will not have a state. That was the trajectory of American foreign policy. It was just moving slower and a bunch of intermediate steps in between, a lot of pretense that that wasn't the policy. Trump cut to the chase. I think it's extremely negative, of course, but I want to just clarify that we, we shouldn't look at this as if these are dramatically different approaches. It's just that one is a little bit more uh, uh, dishonest and the other one is a little bit faster. That was Trita Parsi speaking to me earlier today. Prime Minister Keir Starmer has pledged to introduce new laws to make the spiking of drinks a specific criminal offence. And he's promised that 10,000 bar staff will be trained to spot the signs that drink spiking has taken place. Now, secretly doping people by putting substances in their drinks is reportedly a remarkably common event. This is from research carried out by Anglia Ruskin University for the charity Drink Aware. Um, They say in 2023, 2.2% of UK adults reported having their drinks spiked in the 12 months leading up to the survey, which equates to around 1.2 million UK adults. And prevalence is high, with 11% of UK adults report being spiked at any point in their lives. 9% of males report thinking they've ever been a victim of drink spiking, and 13% of females. I suppose the difficult with these is always that it's going to be sometimes difficult to know if someone, if, if you have been spiked, but I mean, clearly very much a widespread problem. Um, On Newsnight, two victims of drink spiking explained um, what had happened to them. This was anti-spiking activist and former Love Island contestant Sharon Gafka's story. What happened to you, Sharon? Um, So, like you said, I was having lunch with my friends. Apart from everything seemed very normal, apart from when I turned around to my friends that I felt very unwell. Um, We both went to the bathroom. I went to separate cubicles of her. And she came out, went back to the table, 10 minutes had passed, and I hadn't come back. So the girls went back to the bathroom. The cubicle that I'd went into was still locked. They'd shouted my name, no response. So they'd picked the lock. And when they'd finally got in, I was um, completely unconscious. I'd vomited. I'd lost all control of my lower part of my body. So I'd urinated myself. Um, I was half dressed and I'd banged my head on the the toilet. So um, my breathing was also very shallow as well as like the pain I was in from obviously hitting my head. Good Lord. That was a really, really harrowing story. And I suppose, you know, with those things, they could have always been much much worse, right? Because obviously the, the worst case scenario is the person spikes your drink and then, you know, I suppose gets to, you know, sexually assault the person, right? Really, really horrific. Um, also on Newsnight was former Apprentice contestant Ryan Mark Parsons. I was in a busy nightclub in Soho and it seems stupid now, but I just left my drink. And obviously when you're going out and you're having fun, you don't necessarily think about being exceptionally vigilant and watching or monitoring your drinks when you're just going out to have a good time with friends. I went to the loo, left my drink on the side, returned, and pretty much after I had the drink, felt complete delirium, lost all sense of control, similar symptoms to what Sharon was saying. And that lack of control was really terrifying. And it's ultimately changed my mentality when it comes to drinking, even now. I rarely go out and not put a drinks cover over my drink or vociferously watching my drink or, you know, I vape as well and making sure that people aren't tampering with vapes. And I think what's so harrowing is that these horrible criminals are finding various ways to 
spite people. Uh, I, I mentioned in the introduction that you ended up in the boot of a car. Just, mm. just briefly explain to our audience, I mean, you don't know quite how. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the thing. When you get spiked, I mean, so much of that night was totally and utterly fragmented. Mm. And I remember my friends leaving. I hurt my knee. I ended up outside of the club. I'm not sure how. The staff was so dismissive. And I think that was really terrible on the night and, and for the club. And then I found myself in a, in, in a car, uh, com locked don't know how I got there, don't know how I got out, lost all sense of fear and, like I said before, all sense of control, which you experienced as well. Uh, and that is utterly, utterly uh, horrifying. Well, that's completely terrifying, waking up in the boot of a car. Obviously, I, I mean, I think a really brilliant depiction of the trauma um, that this can cause is um, I May Destroy You. Um, really, really brilliant mini series on the BBC. I recommend anyone watch it who hasn't already. Um, back to some statistics. According to um, the Drink Aware study we referred to earlier, many cases of drink spiking go unreported. Around half of incidents are not reported to police because people don't see the point. Of the respondents who did not report the incident to the police, approximately half said they didn't think that there was any point. Almost a quarter of women and almost a third of men didn't tell anyone at all. Um, the question of reporting was put to the Newsnight guests. Did either of you report it to the police? I didn't report it to the police. I didn't either. Do you know why? Um, so two male paramedics had come to the restaurant that I was in when I was spiked. And despite, you know, being a, well, a, a middle 20s woman with a respectable job and a friend who was a doctor, we still weren't believed. And I was told that it was probably my fault. I'd taken something myself or I drank too much and that I should just go home and sleep it off. But um, so to know that, people that are supposed to treat the symptoms, not the situation, and are supposed to safeguard me in the, mo in the situation when I felt the most vulnerable, didn't believe me. Why, why would anybody else believe mm. me? And I'm sure that's probably what you felt too. Yeah, pretty similar. I mean, even my experience in the club, staff were being incredibly dismissive and they were in, pretty much insinuating that I was too drunk. And I, you know your limits when you go out, you know your levels and how much you're drinking. And I knew something was up, mm. despite the fact my memory was incredibly uh, fragmented and I was completely disorientated, but I knew something was wrong. And then I, I, I guess I was just apathetic. And even after uh, the event happened and looking back on it, you see the reports. I think 5,000 reports I saw from 2021 to 22. Mm. 40 convictions in four years out of 5,000 reports. And that encourages apathy. That ex exacerbates people not reporting it. So in terms of sort of the need of a new law, um, I, I, I don't feel expert enough. Need for more training for staff. I mean, those interventions there made that incredibly clear. Um, that definitely the government should be putting more money into training staff because it sounds like both of those people were treated terribly. Um, in terms of the law, there are currently several laws on the British statute books that have been interpreted in a way that makes drink spiking a crime. Um, they range from the 1861 Offence Against the Person Act to the 2003 Sexual Offences Act, but none name the act as a specific crime um, and they often connect it to a further crime like a sexual offence or grievous bodily harm. Um, that's a factor that may affect prosecutions. In 2003, the BBC reported this. Um, figures for England and Wales from the National Police Chiefs Council suggest that between September 2021 and 2022, there were 4,924 reports of spiking-related incidents in one year. However, the Ministry of Justice said that according to its latest figures for both countries, um, which date from November 2017 to November 2021, there were just 40 um, convictions, so incredibly low. Um, I, I imagine it is quite difficult to sort of convict someone for this unless there's like really good CCTV from inside um, the club. Just to repeat again those statistics, so 5,000 reports of spiking in a single year, but just 40 convictions over four years. Um, in a way, I feel like, you know, you shouldn't really be publicising that because people are going to read that and think, God, this is a crime you can get away with. Um, so, yeah, Obviously, dramatic change needed there. Um, research also shows that most cases of spiking lead to no further crime or to crimes that don't involve a sexual offence or grievous bodily harm, such as blackmail, robbery and harassment. Um, again, that's according to Drink Aware. And spiking for the sake of a prank accounted for about 8% of cases. This was Newsnight again. You know, a lot of people even do it for fun, which I think is even more sadistic. You know, you go out to a club and you spike your friends because it's a laugh. I just think the whole thing is you diabolical. You spike your friends? I've heard, yeah, I've yeah. heard lots of anecdotes of people spiking friends. Like university clubs, for example, they just spike their friends because it's a laugh to see them so inebriated and out of control. But it's not funny. And 
the spiking in general just needs to stop. And if it can be eradicated because of this announcement and this proposed change to law, then hopefully that's the case. And spiking your friends for fun is really, really stupid. Um, Mike, I want your take on this. Sort of in terms of reactions to it, I haven't seen anyone on Twitter say actually drink spiking's good. Um, what I have seen is people say this law seems like a way of getting headlines and not necessarily the best way to deal with this. Um, I know Kistan was also sort of introducing respect orders last week, which some people thought was um, necessarily, you know, maybe sort of more about headlines than 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 practicalities. I know. What do you make of this? Yeah, I think often when governments announce policies, yes, they want to tackle an issue, right? So in this case, you know, the governments have taken a line. Certainly one of some of the things they did mention in the lead up to the, the election was, you know, tackling violence against women, right? And, and this was kind of seen through that lens to, to, in some way. Obviously not just women get spiked, let's be clear, but this is part of kind of like a, maybe part of that kind of policy or that, that kind of program. And in some ways you want to signal to voters when you announce a policy that, hey, look, we're taking this thing really, really seriously, right? So that's part of it. And I, but I do think that sometimes when it comes to policies, we need to be careful of introducing policies just for the sake of making statements. And I worry if that's what's happening in this case, because as you mentioned, there are some, some laws that can be interpreted in a way that can mean spiking is prosecuted. Um, and I think what's often the case with violence against women and, and kind of the crimes of this nature is we have the laws and systems in place, but they just don't work. I think Ash tweeted yesterday, what we have, which what actually women feel they need is quite limited time is for laws to work. So Labour has spoken about, I think, how they want to half violence against women, right? That's obviously a really good goal, really good aim. But they haven't made it clear what indicators they're going to use to kind of measure that. So how are we going to know they've reached that goal? These are the kinds of things we need to know. This kind of granular detail of things we need to know. We know that when it comes to kind of sexual offence cases, some of these trials are waiting to, to kind of be heard. I think they're at a record high. As, 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 as of March this year, they're at a record high of kind of cases for sexual offence being heard. So these are the kind of issues that, that need to be fixed. Right? We have systems that aren't actually working so we don't just need new policies. What we need to do is fix what's kind of currently in place. So that's my concern. And I wonder if this is an attempt for, for Labour to kind of show, signal to voters that, hey, look, we're doing something. We're taking this thing seriously because yes, it's sometimes good to signal to voters that you're doing things. But what's actually more important is to actually, you know, fix the things that currently are in place and, and, and make, make the systems that are in place and laws that are in place, A, make these laws kind of more effective and, 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 and you know, not so blunt as maybe some in some cases they are and b let's fix the systems that aren't working that's that's kind of the, the aim of a government who are kind of coming in that's how you brand yourself right? you brand yourself as we're going to fix things that aren't working and i think labor have a chance to do that the commons will vote on whether to legalize assisted dying this friday and it could go down to the wire according to itv news 146 mps have said they will vote for the bill 101 have said they will vote against and 23 have confirmed they will abstain. Now, that means there are 380 MPs who are yet to declare which way they'll go. Um, that means there's lots of time for people to try and influence those MPs. And someone who won't have a vote, but who, who, who is likely to have lots of influence, is Gordon Brown. He's written in The Guardian that spending time with people in their final days showed him that we need not assisted dying, but rather better end-of-life care. In the piece, Brown writes movingly about spending time with his baby in hospital um, before she tragically died after 11 days. Um, he also suggests this legislation for assisted dying is moving too fast at a time when palliative care in Britain is lacking. Um, someone on the other side of the debate is Jess Phillips, who explained to Times Radio why she would support the bill. Look, I fundamentally believe in the right to choose. I don't think that that is going to be a surprise to anybody know, knowing my track record. But I don't take it lightly what bills particularly say and I listen to what people are t telling me and take a large range of views. If this goes through, Jess, three quarters of us in a poll yesterday by the Sunday Times said they didn't think the NHS is actually in a fit enough state to provide assisted dying. Are you confident it is? I don't look. I, I think that if you look at all the reports, like the report by Lord Darcy recently, the NHS is not in a fit enough state, and that is why the government is investing twenty six billion pounds in bringing it back up to where it should be. And you'd vote but for assisted dying in spite of that. You, but you cannot stop progress. In terms of progress, there's been a, a tube advertisement from a campaign in favour of legislative change, which sort of people have suggested is not the progress we want. So it shows a woman in silky pyjamas dancing around and saying, my dying wish is my family won't see me suffer um, and I won't have to. 
Um, now, people who are annoyed about this um, say it, it looks as if it sort of amounts to the encouragement and even celebration of people ending their lives to save the feelings of their their family. Um, and the advert really is seen as seen by critics as an example of how legalizing assisted dying could impact popular culture. Um, of course, the law will have more immediate effects on the medical profession, um, who will have a key role in the process of assisted dying, specifically um, according to the legislation as it's currently written up, for anyone to become eligible for assisted death, um, two doctors would need to confirm they fit the relative criteria, and that's before um, the person goes to get sign-off from a high court judge. Um, some doctors have welcomed the move, um, even if it does sort of give them these new responsibilities. In a letter to the Times, 55 leading medics, including 13 former Royal College presidents and four former presidents of the British Medical Association have urged MPs to vote for the assisted dying bill. Um, in the letter, they wrote this. The status quo in this country is not working. The blanket prohibition of assisted dying has made the way we deliver end-of-life care in this country more cruel and more dangerous. Currently dying, people are sometimes forced to suffer against their wishes or we turn a blind eye as they travel to other countries for an assisted death or take matters into their own hands in desperate ways. We have seen these things happen too many times in our professional and personal lives. Um, not everyone, though, in the medical profession is comfortable with how this bill could change the relationship between a doctor and their patient. Bill Noble is a retired palliative care physician and former president of the Association for Palliative Medicine. Earlier today, um, I asked him what he makes of the bill in its current form. Well, the main thing is that it's treating assisted dying or assisted suicide or euthanasia, as it's called in other countries, like any other treatment in medicine, which it isn't. It's something much more important and it's much more a concern for the individual rather than a decision between their doctor and, and the patient. Uh, so I would like to see it handled by some kind of agency outside healthcare, because I think whenever a doctor does something for you, you trust them to do the right thing for you and the best thing for you. And in fact, we put a lot of effort as medics into gaining people's trust. And it seems to me that we wouldn't necessarily think of assisted dying as the best thing for you at a particular time. Only you know that. Is that that different though to other situations with a doctor because you know sometimes you do go to a doctor and they'll give you a, a series of choices and they'll say well this one comes with these risks but would come with these positive benefits this one comes with these risks but would come with these positive benefits um, they might say if it were me I would maybe choose this but it's also sort of perfectly reasonable for other sensible people to choose the different course of action if if they're sort of putting sort of the reality of the situation in front of the patient and giving the patient the choice, even if sort of in their heart of hearts that they don't want them to take that decision, isn't that something that doctors do actually sort of quite often do? Well, yes, we do when it's to do with medical choices. But none of us have the same idea about what death is as between each other. Uh, it, doctors don't talk to you when you're about to get married about what the children are going to be like or whether or not you should leave your estate to your son or your daughter or whatever. It's, it's not really the same sort of decision in my view. It's a much more personal one. It's almost beyond medicine. Yeah, that's, that, that is really interesting actually. So I suppose, do you think maybe it should be someone like a, a social worker or a counsellor, someone who can sort of talk through more existential issues than issues regarding sort of medical medical treatment? Yes, I think so. I mean, particularly the way that we're talking about it at the moment, it's to do with whether or not you fit the category that the law has decided can have assisted suicide. And um, certainly, I mean, I've had experience of families in other countries who um, go beyond what, what's reasonable in thinking about how they can present the case for assist, uh, for uh, euthanasia to the authorities in order for them to get the, the euthanasia. It's, it's very complicated uh, to make sure, particularly in the Netherlands, 
that you actually say the right things to the doctors or you won't get it. So I suppose to, to, to st- take a step back, I know you've been looking over the legislation much more carefully than I have, but there is a judge involved and there is a doctor involved. Now, could it not be the case that the doctor's job is purely to say whether or not this person, um, if nature were to, t- to take its course, would die within six months? So basically, the, the doctor is just saying this person is eligible because they are genuinely terminally ill. And then it's the judge who says, and they're not being coerced. So there you, you are just as a medic being sort of asked to make the kind of judgment you do make all the time, right? If you're a, a, a cancer doctor and you give someone their prognosis, you're often going to be saying, I think you might have six months or a year or whatever. So that wouldn't be expanding their their role into sort of a, a different philosophical domain. You're describing a process which I would approve of, where, where the, the only role for the medic is... Uh, giving information about prognosis, uh, given one treatment, the other, or no treatment at all. And uh, then the law makes the decision as to whether or not they're eligible for assisted dying. Um, By the way, you don't need a doctor just to hand over the pills either. That's, you know, it's going to be uh, a process whereby that's done without any assistance. Uh, You just give a prescription or, or supply the medicine. So that's not really a medical procedure either. So, yeah, I think that would, be, that would be reasonable. So that calls into question about what these criteria are. And at the moment, they're looking at a prognosis of less than six months. Now, how do doctors decide about what a prognosis is? Well, I'll tell you. We work on the median survival of a population of patients that's, a, that's the same as the one in front of you. And that's how we choose which cancer treatment to give, what gives the best uh, median survival. Now, the median survival is the time at which 50% of a given population have died. So there's, by definition, another 50% uh, already living uh, who will live beyond that. And um, also, uh, the way that survivals are distributed throughout the population isn't what's known as a a normal or Gaussian distribution. There aren't the most people around the median. It's a long tail distribution. So that that means that only about 10% of people who uh, are in a population with the same illness as you die at the same time as you. That's sort of 45% before you and 45% after you. And so the whole question of what the nature of the information about prognosis is, is probably not what people think it is. And I suppose someone might be listening to this who's in favour of assisted dying. I mean, I, I, I generally um, am. And they'll be thinking, look, I, I don't really care what profession has the, the responsibility of ticking the box or signing the document. Um, I'm perfectly capable of understanding that if I have a six-month prognosis, there's a small chance I might live for 10 years, but I'm, I'm, I'm willing to take the risk that I, I don't want to keep going um, because my quality of life is very poor. And they say this bill going through Parliament on Friday is potentially the, the last chance we'll get in a long while to legalise this. And I'm very fearful. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not personally, but I'm sort of putting this forward. Maybe if you're older, if you're getting on in life and you're saying, I'm, I'm very fearful that soon I could be in a situation where I'm terminally ill, I'm having a completely awful time, um, I'm not getting anything from life at all, and I want to, to, to be able to choose to, to end this. And they might say, well, it, 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 who, who, I, I, as I said before, you know, I, I don't care who signs a document, just pass this goddamn legislation so I don't have to live with this fear anymore. How would you respond to that? Well, I think it could be made a lot safer because the problem isn't you. The problem is people who are being coerced into doing it for reasons that the family think are a good idea or because they're, um, they have guilt about how much of a burden they are on everybody. Um, so that's, that's what we have to – those are the people we have to protect. We're not protecting the people who really want it. Uh, and the question is, how do we make it as safe as we can? Now, the problem is that the government have not done an impact assessment of what the, of the current bill. So in my view, um, it makes doctors what might be in law termed an attractive menace. Um, a caring doctor with a license to kill is, is pretty attractive under these circumstances and an easy way to get assisted dying. 
if it were a more formal process where you know what criteria you have to fulfill, where a someone that is either legally qualified or qualified in social work can actually determine that there's no coercion uh, and has the information that they need from, from medicine concerning that case, I think that would be a lot safer. And also, I think because it's not just another treatment, the whole population would take it a lot more seriously than they might do otherwise. Yeah, that is interesting. So you're basically, I suppose to, to summarize where I think you're coming from, correct me if I'm wrong, you kind of want a third profession involved. So uh, what's going to be proposed now is that a, a medic decides, is this person terminally ill and are they being um, coerced? Um, are they sort of of sound mind and are they being coerced? And then I think it's kind of the case that the judge will be doing a bit of a tick boxing exercise saying, as far as I can tell by law, everything seems to have been done correctly. And then it happens. You're saying, let's have a doctor to talk about the, the prognosis. Then let's have a social worker or a counsellor or whoever to make the judgment about coercion. And then we have the judge to say everything seems to have gone legally correctly. And, and, and if that were the situation, you'd be happier. Yeah, the judges at the moment are saying they need evidence in front of them. So that would, that would fulfill that. Doctors can do two things. They can talk about prognosis in terms that I've described, and they can talk about uh, soundness of mind. Has the patient got the capacity to make the decision uh, and it isn't being influenced by the by, by their disease. I mean, that you know, they haven't a mental illness, a depression that makes them see everything in very black terms. So is, is, it, is it okay from that point of view? But beyond that, I don't think we have the expertise. I don't think we can detect coercion and I don't think we can detect when somebody's really doing it for altruistic reasons, which at the moment don't fall within the law. Finally, just to clarify this, at the moment, the legislation would be asking a doctor to make those judgments. Is that correct? That's my view. I think the doctor has to satisfy themselves that everything's okay. Uh, by the way, there was a judge, and I don't know his name, on Radio 4, uh, I think this morning, who was saying it's not a tick box exercise. It can't be. It has to be a process whereby the judge is properly assured that there is evidence that everything is okay. That was Bill Noble speaking to me earlier today. Now, as you could maybe tell there, I wasn't 100% sure of the precise role the assisted dying bill said doctors should have in this process. So I looked it up um, after that conversation. It says this, before countersigning a person's declaration, the attending doctor and the independent doctor, having separately examined the person and the person's medical records, and each acting independently of the other, must be satisfied that the person is terminally ill, has the capacity to make the decision to end their own life. So those are the two things that Bob says doctors do normally do. But then C has a clear and settled intention to end their own life, which has been reached voluntarily on an informed basis and without undue influence, coercion or duress. So I can see how that does um, sort of add a, a, a new sort of type of role um, to the doctor that they don't currently have. Um, for their part, it's worth saying the British Medical Association has adopted a position of neutrality um, on the question of assisted dying. Um, their focus is on saying that doctors need strong protection so they can opt out if they don't want to be part of the process. Uh, before we move on from this topic, let's quickly um, go back to the part of this issue I feel more qualified to talk about. That's the politics of all this, uh, because the debate over assisted dying has reopened um, a debate about the appropriate role of religion in politics. Um, the row started after the Justice Secretary Shabana Mahmood expressed her opposition to the assisted dying bill in a letter to a constituent. In that letter, she said this. Uh, sadly, recent scandals such as Hillsborough infected blood and the post office horizon have reminded us that the state and those acting on its behalf are not always benign. I have always held the view that for this reason, the state should serve a clear role. It should protect and preserve life, not take it away. The state should never offer death as a service. Um, in response to that letter, Labour peer Charlie Faulkner said this on Sky News. I think she's completely wrong in relation to that. She, and I respect this, has religious and spiritual reasons why she believes completely in the sanctity of life. And in her statement or her letter to constituents, she makes that clear. And that is her starting point. I respect that religious belief, but I do not think it should be imposed on everybody else. That's her starting point. She then goes on to criticise, quote, the fact that the, that the 
safeguards are not strong enough. She's wrong about that. And the reason she's wrong is perhaps demonstrated by the three people named the director of public prosecutions, the three previous directors of public prosecutions, say the current situation is much more dangerous than that which the bill proposes. Charlie Faulkner's reference to religious beliefs not being imposed on people has drawn strong criticism from senior religious figures. The Cardinal Archbishop of Westminster told Times Radio this. I thought we lived in a democracy where people were permitted to express their views and to take forward an argument, and a rational argument at that. If Mr Faulkner can't extend that um, space to religious belief, then I'm not sure why he should be in politics, actually. It's not as if politics were a separate, sealed-off way of living. It's part of the life of this country. And religious belief is very much part of the life of this country. And the majority of people in the world actually hold a religious belief in God. So it's Charlie Faulkner who's in the box, not me. And over on Newsnight, Nick Watt explained how Faulkner's comments were going down in the House of Commons. A row has broken out this evening. Complaints, I understand, may be written complaints to the government chief whip, Sir Alan Campbell, over the behaviour of Lord Faulkner, the former Lord Chancellor, who is in favour of this legislation. He had a go at the cabinet ministers who were speaking out against it, particularly having a go at Shabana McMood, the Justice Secretary. And what her supporters are saying is Shabana McMood was writing a letter her to her constituents. That's absolutely what you should do. They think Lord Faulkner is out of line. Uh, Mike, this has all sparked a big row um, about the role of religion in politics. We seem to have sort of one of these rows every few years. Um, I always find them fairly interesting. Um, what do you make of it? Was 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 Lord Faulkner sort of right to point out that Shabana Mahmood, I mean, to be fair to him, she had said in the letter that her religion did play a role and he was just sort of repeating what she'd said, but people have taken it quite badly. Um, what do you make of it? Yeah, look, I have such huge sympathy for Shabana Mahmood just because I probably arrived to a similar position to her in terms of my faith influences my politics, right? So I don't know how many of our listeners know this, but I've arrived to the left on the basis of my faith. So I am a Christian, I have a strong faith, and I was politicized by this kind of kind of anger I had about inequality, um, marginalization of those around me. So my faith influences so much my politics, right? Influences my anger when I hear kind of Labour and Conservative politicians advocate for and 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 use dehumanizing rhetoric against marginalized communities advocate it, it kind of informs my really pro migrant position it informs the position i have which is about caring for the most marginalized and having equitable systems of, of, of social justice in this country and trying to kind of uh, t- tackle inst- institutionalized discrimination institutionalized problems in this country that that's how my faith is kind of influenced by politics so i did feel a bit uncomfortable with this idea that, like you know people's faith shouldn't kind of or just kind of dismissing the faith in politics right because it informs so much of my belief system and it informs so much of the kind of care I have for others now not everyone on the left has arrived to that position I totally understand that not everyone you know often what happens is Christians arrive to the right maybe but I, I haven't done that right my kind of interpretation of scripture has led me to the left so my faith is important to me and I and I, and I, I wouldn't want it to be dismissed but at the same time, I'm not, I wouldn't, I'm not trying to impose my faith on anyone. I'm just saying these, my belief system is, is kind of linked to that. So mm-hmm. it's an interesting one. I think when it's just dying, I, I do worry a bit about it. And it is partly informed by my faith, but also more broadly, I do think the point about coercion is a bit of a concern for me because I, I wonder, the bill, so proponents of the bill are saying that the coercion is kind of a part of the bill, right? And kind of protection against coercion is part of the bill. I'm not quite clear how it is and, and I'd love someone who's maybe read the bill more closely than I have to point out to me where it does play a role but I haven't quite seen it and my fear is that we know that you know fortunately in this current moment in time sick and disabled people do at times suffer um, in terms of like poor treatments when they're being looked after and I wonder if we can't def- if we're not able to kind of clearly define coercion how are we going to you know know that people aren't being coerced into kind of it's just a dying essentially I, I do I do worry about that and I think more broadly I worry about you know we live in a system, unfortunately, in Britain, again, to one, of, one of my core, core passions is trying to address it, it kind of issues of equi- equability in, in, in Britain, kind of equality, et cetera, right? I worry about the lack of equality in Britain. And one of the things we have a lack of equality in is, is, is you know, palliative care and, and kind of social distance support for those who are suffering, right? I wonder about not fixing those systems first, potentially, um, and again, look, I understand that, you know, for some people, palliative care is not going to help end or, or, or help them um, 
given the condition they're in. And I totally have sympathy for that. But I do worry about kind of not fixing those, not even attempting to kind of fix those systems first before kind of advocating for this to die. And so, yeah, when it comes to faith in politics, look, I, I, I would, I can't sit here and say it should have no role in politics, given that the very reason I'm on the bar live right now, Michael, talking to you is because I have such a strong social consciousness that is driven by my faith, it's driven by my my love for others, the kind of unrelenting love I have for others, the needs for the most marginalised to be lifted up. And that all comes from my faith. So for me, it has a massive role. For others, it doesn't. And that's totally fine. I respect that. But yeah, for me, it's a has a massive role, maybe shapes my, my view of this bill um, and my concerns over this bill. Well, I like that you were brought here by an unrelenting love for others. I think that's quite wonderful. Um, I want to go to a really important comment from one of our mods, Shiny Warm, who says... Pain isn't the only issue. My own diagnosis has an endpoint of complete paralysis that might go on for months or years before I die um, with aspirational pneumonia. Palliative care won't fix it. Um, now, I can also see in the comments loads and loads of solidarity being thrown your way. Um, I would like to sort of join that wave of solidarity um, to you, Shiny Warm. Um, I mean, if you, I, I'm sort of interested in how this informs your views on this debate. Um, about assisted dying. Obviously, this isn't a phone-in show, but if you do get a chance to put it in in the comments before uh, the show ends, that'd be interesting. I'd love to read that out. Um, let's also go to an update, very important update. Um, Benjamin Netanyahu says Israeli security, or Benjamin Netanyahu, sorry, um, has said the Israeli security cabinet has approved a ceasefire deal with Hezbollah, and the deal will be presented to the full cabinet and could come into force as early as tomorrow. Uh, this is a quote from Netanyahu. Hezbollah is no longer the same. We set them back decades. We have destroyed many missiles and rockets. We have killed many terrorists. Um, senior Hezbollah officials tell Al Jazeera um, that Netanyahu cannot be trusted in terms of the actual proposed deal will need to be reviewed. Um, that's according, according to Jeremy Scahill on X. Tom Watson is now a Labour peer in the House of Lords. Um, of course, you might remember him better as the former deputy leader of the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn, um, who took every opportunity to undermine Corbyn's credibility. He ended up in the Lords. That's often how these things work out. Um, the Lords certainly um, seems to have worked well for Tom Watson, um, and he seems to have been a bit braver about showing his true colours. Watson is currently on the payroll of US tech firm Palantir. Um, the Times reports that Palantir has recently um, been awarded, oh sorry, that, that's it's the Times who report Tom Watson's relationship to Palantir. This is separately. Um, Palantir has recently been awarded a £330 million contract to create an NHS patient data system, but has long been accused of seeking NHS contracts in order to mine confidential patient data for profit. Um, the Times report goes into some of the details saying this. Watson has declared on the latest Lord's Register of Members' interest that he is being paid as a member of the company's Public Services Advisory Board. Um, the peer was the MP for West Bromwich East in the Midlands from 2001 to 2019 and was Labour's deputy leader. While he was an MP, Watson accepted £540,000 in donations from Max Mosley um, and supported racing businessmen's campaign for tighter privacy laws against the press. Um, and it goes on. Um, Palantir's UK arm is run by Louis Mosley a nephew of the F1 racing boss and grandson of Sir Oswald Mosley, who of course founded the British Union of Fascists. Um, earlier this year, Mosley told the Times, fundamentally what Palantir provide is very powerful and therefore potentially very dangerous. We will only work in countries that are subject to the rule of law and Western alliance. So I hadn't, hadn't realised that it was actually a Mosley um, who runs the, the UK arm of, of Palantir. Obviously, the Mosleys have a long-time connection to Tom Watson. Um, for their part, the British, the, the British Medical Association has strongly objected to Palantir's um, involvement in the NHS, calling the awarding of contracts to the firm deeply worrying. Um, and last year, Tory Cabinet Minister David Davis, or former Tory Cabinet Minister David Davis, called Palantir the wrong company to be put in charge of our precious data resource. Um, he does have some potential good reason for saying such things. This is from The Guardian last year. Um, they say the Palantir has been viewed with suspicion in the UK over its history arising from the US spy industry and links with the CIA. Peter Thiel, its founder and chair, who was a notable financial backer of Trump, has claimed the UK has Stockholm syndrome when it comes to its affection for the health service. However, in contrast, um, Palantir's chief executive, Alex Karp, um, has said he wished the US had a healthcare system that served the poor and undeserved or underserved, sorry, not underserved, as well as uh, he perceives the British system does. 
Um, others have opposed Palantir's involvement in the NHS because of the other government contracts it holds. So in the United States, um, Palantir um, seems to be involved in mass deportations. The company's software helped the US Immigration Enforcement Agency carry out Donald Trump's um, deportation policy introduced in 2017. Um, the interceptors also accused Palantir of helping the LAPD um, justify racist policing. And in 2013, documents leaked by Edward Snowden revealed that Palantir helped build the NSA's mass internet surveillance program, X Key Score. Um, Palantir also does a roaring trade with Israel. This is from a Tribune article last year. Uh, the company has provided military and surveillance technology to the Israeli government for years, they say, including predictive policing services used as part of the occupation to systematically harass and detain Palestinians. Such predictive systems are used by Israel to analyze the social media posts of Palestinians. In 2010, Israel issued Military Order 1651, which imposes a 10-year sentence on anyone who attempts to influence public opinion in the West Bank in a manner they deem harmful to public order or who publishes words of praise for hostile organizations. Um, the Tribune article goes on to say this. For years, the Israeli army has used broad military orders to intimidate and arrest Palestinian human rights activists engaged in nonviolent protests. Palantir's racially profiled analytic systems therefore facilitate the unjust arrest of Palestinians. Many have faced long prison sentences for simply posting photos of family members killed or imprisoned by Israeli forces, citing Quranic verses or calling for protests. Um, Tom Watson um, was asked by the Times about his new role, and the peer said he was, quote, looking forward to advising Palantir on how their software can help improve um, public services. So obviously, he's saying his priority is we want Palantir and the NHS to work together in a mutually beneficial way. Um, other people are less sure. Mike, where do you stand on this? When it comes to, I think, when it, when it comes to the House of Lords, I think this story exposes one of the issues with the House of Lords in that we have unelected officials playing such a fundamental role to the legislative process, or while the taxpayer funds them. Like that's the kind of, this kind of lobbyist culture in our politics is is being exposed really by this issue. And I think that's a real democratic deficit issue for me, where rather than having these voices enhanced, you know, the voices of ordinary citizens are being kind of minimised in the process, right? We're seeing, in some cases, less contact hours by some constituency MPs with their constituents. And again, part of that might be driven for safety reasons. I do totally respect that, but I think... Yeah, I, I worry about this, and, and I think for Labour as well, it's an, it's, an, it's an odd one because I think Keir Starmer, certainly at some stage, and I forget the many Keir Starmer u turns, but I'm pretty sure at one stage Keir Starmer was advocating for the abolition of the House of Lords. So, yeah, I, I just wonder how all of this sits with with that kind of mission. And, and, and more broadly, I think the one thing we don't need in our policies, one thing the last Conservative government towards us is we don't need this kind of like lobbyist culture in our politics. We don't need people with these vested interests entering our politics um, with these kind of clear biases. That for me is not democracy. Democracy is not the taxpayer footing the bill for people like Tom Watson to enter the House of Lords. Uh, let's wrap up there. Um, thank you everyone for watching tonight. Come back tomorrow for another show from 6pm for now. You've been watching Navarra Media. Good night.